Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the second uh, interdisciplinary part. I'm a political scientist, and so I don't have slides either. Okay. Uh, and also, mine is, is different in that I don't have data, unless you believe, as I do, that the plural of anecdote is data. <laughs> I, I study elite decision making in mostly in the foreign policy area. And that's where I'll take my both my examples, but I think what I'm talking about today is pretty universal. And it does share though know, some of the reality that Gord was talking about and overlaps with a, a number of the presentations so far. And let me just mention two before I explain exactly where I'm going with this. Uh, one is that uh, I, my work started out as purely cognitive, looking at, in effect, applying forms of you know, unmotivated biases, you know, heuristics and biases in literature, and really even long before the <coughs> Kahneman, but related stuff. But later on, I uh, re-examined, partly as a result of, of where psychology was going, and decided that Although there is important parts of that, I mentioned one of the important parts, that really much of this very large chunks that are very strongly related to emotions, and I think overlap with the sort of motives that you're talking about here. Um, all right, when I, I started in this, I was looking at the, the problem I was dealing with, and I still deal with, is how decision makers perceive other countries, especially how they draw inferences about whether others are hostile or not. Part of this grew out of, the, and this was my research done during the Cold War, it was a, basically a, a split in the country between hawks and doves, both in the analysis uh, in the more academic area and obviously in public opinion in the political area. And a lot of this was views about what the Soviet Union was like, how hostile it was. Uh, and so I was using the question of how do actors infer others' intentions from a set of behavior that always is, as in Tory's example of Donald and Michael, inherently ambiguous, indeed much more ambiguous than actors realize. Uh, and that's still, so sort of that's the fundamental problem I built, built out of. Uh, in some ways, it's quite similar to what a lot of you people do, in that it's a, a real problem, if you will, of cognition in the wild, that here are problems people are, intellectual problems people have to solve in order to act effectively. But it's different from a lot, I think, of the work in, that done in cognitive psychology or in other branches of psychology, and that uh, not only that I'm dealing with elites, I don't think that matters per se. I think what matters is that I'm dealing with people who are working themselves on problems that really are crucial to them. I mean, if they get them wrong, <laughs> right, they could, in my case, destroy the country. So. These problems are ones that are really fully occupying all their brain power, and they're usually doing it over a prolonged period of time. I think this matters, in the, something that I'm not going to stress here. I'm skeptical of Danny Kahneman's System 1 and System 2, right? My people are very self-conscious, they have a lot of apparatus supporting them also, bringing up the information, uh, and they have a lot of time. So granted, the initial to almost instinctive reactions, I think, may play a role. Some of what they're doing, and I'll come back to, is not conscious. But I can't get leverage from the system one, system two. I just don't think that. And it makes me skeptical of the whole thing, but OK. So. Um, uh, one final thing I have to say for the people, some students in the audience who are psychologists. Years ago when I was at UCLA, I presented uh, an application of attribution theory to 
problems like this using diplomatic documents. I presented this to Harold Kelly's uh, group. And it's really marvelous, and it's really great. And I had great fun. And afterwards, one of them came up to me and said, you know, enjoy this. And at the end, it's in the I, I explained that this was something they might want to work on, a really rich written document, had lots of things you could do. And I said, well, President Jervis, I, I hope I'm not rude, but if I did what you said, I'd ruin my career. <laughs> so do not try this uh, at home. <laughs> okay. so I've already chewed up, and you know a little too much fun. What? <clears throat> I'm looking at essentially as an understanding beliefs. What drives people's beliefs about how the world works, about uh, what others, again, intentions are, how we explain the behavior you know, of other actors. And obviously there are an enormous number of factors. But I think two are really quite central. One much more cognitive that I want to just be briefer on, and the other more you know, emotive. The more cognitive one is the importance of expectations. That uh, Tori talked about uh, seeing things when we share it, and I argue that uh, what we see depends on what we believe. Uh, instead of saying, I'll believe it when I see it, that much more, and you know, the work people in this room pretty much not know that, that uh, I'll see it when I believe it. You know, only if we expect certain things to be there will we see it. In other words, uh, our pre existing beliefs about anything once formed are very, very powerful influences on how we interpret incoming information, you know, very strong forms of confirmation bias in lots of uh, different ways, form of you know, premature cognitive closure. Now that phrase, unfortunately, all three terms obviously are ambiguous, especially premature by definition says shouldn't be done that quickly. Uh, all I'd argue here is in, in lots of experiments from the lab and in lots and lots of cases that, you know, I see in the political world, you, know, you get two people who come into new information with different mindsets, you know, I can tell you how they're going to interpret the information. And that they will do this quite quickly, and there are reasons both in terms of evolutionary psychology and in terms of politics why people would do this. Let me just give you the, the political I mean, the, a lot of the others will be familiar to you, but the political incentives in the government may be, be less familiar. And that is that within the government, you are, it's very complex. There are lots of different parts, and there are people and staffs you know, bringing things up to their bosses, and their bosses, and do multi levels are always constantly going into meetings with people in different parts of the organization. And again, certainly the foreign policy and security area, which is my area. The worst thing that happens for your boss is she's in the room and her opposite number says, Well, according to the latest report, that's why, and you haven't seen it and don't know it. You are dead meat. So this means, and you know, this is true, we can do it at you know, the government. Innumerable levels, and true at all levels. So what it means is that if your something has happened, and you get literally the raw cable traffic or the latest overhead photography, that the obvious thing, if the whole system was sensible, said, you know, this is pretty ambiguous. I should think about it, and also I'm in, say, CIA, and I know that the people in State Department or Department of Energy take these little proliferation things, may have a different perspective. So we should take time, you know, to really work it at our level before we alert anyone, right? Can't do it! 
you just can't do it. You're going to be fired. So you've got to get your interpretation up to your boss so she's not sandbagged at the next meeting. And this is, goes all the way up to the president. I can, the example is from the uh, Iraq WMD case where it did go to the president in 24 hours and the answer given was the wrong answer and the people who provided the answer could not back off it. Okay, so uh, these the cognitive impulses here are um, interpretation and are very strong, but what I want to talk about now is more emotional and it is given by, I believe, the fact that we want to minimize pain of considering value trade-offs. That is, we decision makers all the time and we are in our private lives talk all the time about uh, hard choices. And we both pride ourselves, you know, oh, we make hard choices. I think the title is, it, I think it's Bush's memoirs, one of the memoirs of hard choices. Well, but hard choices are very, very unpleasant. I mean, if they are hard, what that means, several things. It means, first, I usually could be wrong, because if they're hard, Right there, 49, 51, and okay, if it's that, there's, we all know there's tremendous noise in the system in various ways, so it could be, it could be no, I could be wrong. It also means, uh, and this is a little different, it overlaps, that my choice uh, has a high cost to it in one, or, one of two ways, and maybe both of them. One, <coughs> a cost to get an expected utility because I could be wrong. The other is even if I'm really pretty sure I'm right, and you can be confident, you can say this is a you know a 45, 55 case, but I'm confident I'm right I have so much information. So you could do that. But what it means also if it's hard is you're probably giving up a lot of things to get what you want. So hard choices are really painful. They are psychologically disturbing. <coughs> and so people, in fact, you know, don't, when they make their choice, they often don't think it's hard. Some of this is post decisional, maybe go back even to testing and dissonance, uh, but a fair amount of it is, at least <coughs> in explicitly, not implicitly, is pre <coughs> That is, I see people doing this before they made a formal decision. Now, they may have made the decision in a way that they don't want to articulate, or more likely, that they're not aware of themselves. And that we're familiar with a lot of the work on that. The fact that most of our cognitive processes are unavailable to us. Uh, all right, what, is this, what does this mean? Uh, that, uh, as usual, let me give it with an example. And I'll take the Iraq WMD case, and there are, there are lots of others I could give as well. Um, see, um, so I'm going to give, okay, so I'm not going to do the WMD. I'm going to take the case that I've been working on most recently, which is the case of one of the enhanced interrogation techniques or what I think should be called torture. And as you may know, there was a report from the majority report from the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence on these going back uh, over this. And I've just written a review of this for the uh, Journal of Foreign Affairs. Anyway, what the, what the majority report says is uh, essentially it tells a fairy tale. And the fairy tale is this, uh, uh, that these, te you know, these techniques were terrible, never use the word torture, all use the word torture, uh, that only the CIA knew about it, that this was done without full knowledge of the White House. Yes, I see some skepticism. <laughs> some of you were in more touch with reality than the Senate committee. This is truly criticism. Uh, that uh, they uh, 
and most important, and, and, that, and that the Senate committee never knew about it, that's a fantasy too, and most importantly that the torture was totally ineffective. It produced no useful information. So uh, this is a, there is no value trading. In other words, they don't say torture is, was not authorized, or it's immoral, I think it is, but it was effective. They share themselves the difficult choice of saying, oh my God, should we torture when we know that torture in fact is effective? And of course it's effective, you, otherwise you wouldn't need to ban it, right? We don't ban things that don't work and are stupid. So uh, why do they do this? Why did they write this report and why did the media accept it Largely. This is a very convenient fairy tale in that it gives us a reality, and here I think the shared reality may be more important than I thought. If we can convince ourselves that this is true, we can then make it, we can then perhaps be more successful, back to the morning stage, in resisting the temptation to torture next time around because there will be a next time problem. And uh, you know, how do you resist that? Well, one way to resist it is to build a shared view, view of reality that, if you really think about it, makes very little sense. It's not likely to actually be true. But if you can do it, you do two things that are very powerful. One is you uh, you make it much easier on yourself. You, and here, Susan and others have talked about uh, people as cognitive misers. Well, we may be emotional misers too. It's very draining to, and depleting, to go through thinking about all the areas in which you've made a decision that has sacrificed very important values that you hold, even views of yourself deserting the ship. So if you can convince yourself and have a shared view that uh, we're not sacrificing our safety by agreeing not to torture people, that's a very comfortable position. It can work, may work politically, it may work psychologically, and it may work in sharing this so that this report and other things like this that, I can't, that don't work as well in the shared thing, I think are ways in which people construct their reality in order to uh, make their, to live more easily with themselves. Finally, and let me just link it to what Tori was saying about the in-group and out-group. When you have people who disagree, but who have both these impulses, first the uh, assimilation of pre-existing information to their beliefs, and then the desire to avoid trade-offs, you will get very heavy polarization as people are exposed to the same information. And that really then complicates the conversation between the people or groups. Because it's one thing, okay, I can understand how you disagree with me. But I can't, and, but if you're rational, you'd see that this new information clearly supports my view and not yours. Now, balance, you know, you might say that you're right, but clearly you can't feel that, say, torture is, is effective. So, when you have that, it does mean that the inference to the people you're dealing with, either in other countries or the other people within the government, are as for example, either a stupid, crazy, or lying. And that is then gives you something that's comfortable psychologically, but really hard to run a good political and social system. Thank you. Thank you.